So, if you're visiting with us, we go verse by verse through the Bible. We pick a book of the Bible, sometimes two books. Recently, we went through Romans. We're still in John. We're praying about maybe starting another book. But until then, we'll be in John's Gospel. Uh, and it's, it's called expository preaching. It's where you go verse by verse and explain what the Bible says. And I believe that's the best way to go. Because um, it's, it's more important that you hear what God has to say than what some man has to say, right? So that's why we, we look intently into God's Word. We have come to chapter 11 now. We're going to start a new chapter in John's Gospel. And that means we're going to see another miracle take place. Um, this is the, going to be the seventh sign that Jesus performs publicly to show who he is. And then he's going to make another great I am statement because in John chapter 11, it's all about the resurrection of Lazarus. He is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Now, it's a long story. The entire chapter is about that. There's 57 verses. So we're going to have to break it down as we go through it. And I'm basically just going to introduce it today. But Jesus is going to say, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, as I introduce this, it's so important, I think, to point this out. Um, I've titled this, Why Did This Happen, God? Why Did This Happen, God? One of the most asked questions that I've had as a pastor in close to 40 years of ministry is, why do bad things happen to good people? And of course, there's really an easy answer to that. There are no good people. <laughs> All right? Um, you know, I think people look up to heaven and say, God, why are you doing things to good people? And the angels are up there going, why do these people imagine themselves to be so good? So, of course, the easy answer to that is we live on a fallen planet a sinful planet, when Adam and Eve sinned, the second law of thermodynamics came into effect. And now the universe is dying. People are dying. There is sickness, disease, and death. All a result is the curse of sin. And we who are born in it, we are just part of it. That's the way it is. Um, I think... A greater question is, why do bad things happen to God's people? Because God's people are forgiven from their sins. God's people are righteous in his sight. So why do bad things continue to happen to them? To me, that's a greater question. Now, I don't like pretending that I have all the answers like some people do. Um, I can answer this somewhat for you, to, under to understand it a little. But to be honest with you, I just think some things that happen, that it's just going to be on our human understanding to grasp it. Deuteronomy 29.29 29 says, the secret things belong to God. That verse tells me that there are things that, that are going to happen that only God can understand in his infinite mind. We can't understand it fully in our finite minds. So there are things that are going to happen. I mean, police officers see things happen. Paramedics see things happen. Uh, any soldier that's fought in a war, they see things happen. And they see some very bad, suffering, 
just, just stuff that is beyond understanding that takes place. And the question always is, if God is all loving, like the Bible says, and if God is all powerful, why doesn't he intervene? And when it comes to that, that is where I think we're going to have to have faith and trust that the Bible is true. God is all loving and God is all powerful. Therefore, God must have a purpose for it, even when it doesn't make sense to us. So as God says in Isaiah, as the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than your ways. So some things are going to happen. We're not going to fully understand. We're just going to have to accept it. And, uh, you know, things happen to God's people. I see it. To the best of God's people. And I see things happen to innocent children. I see, we see heinous things happen in our world that, that are at another level. And I do believe some of these things that happen, some of these crimes that are committed, they are demon-influenced. The devil is behind it. But then again, if God is all-powerful, the devil is not. If God is sovereign, listen, then God allows it for his purposes. And we're just going to have to trust him in all that. But as we go through this story... A sickness and a death happens to one of God's family, families. Let's look at this and let's see if the Holy Spirit can speak to us on this matter of why did this happen, God. So, uh, number one, I'm going to make four points today. Number one, let's look at God's people. Sickness and suffering definitely comes. To God's people. John 11 verse 1 says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now the Holy Spirit is moving John's pen. And the Holy Spirit wants us to clearly see before we even see this sickness and death that this happens to a, to a family that is special to Jesus. So a lot of times we hear we read the Gospels about Jesus performing miracles, and we read about the blind man. We read about the lame man. We read about the woman at the well, right? This, we get their names. This is Lazarus. This is Mary. This is Martha. They are Jesus' close friends. They are friends of Jesus that supported his ministry, that helped in his ministry. They kept Jesus in their home. And John says, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, some people read that and go, man, that's not going to happen until chapter 12. <laughs> well, listen, John already knows the full story when he's writing this gospel. So the Holy Spirit is just putting there in there. This is the Mary. This is the Mary that poured perfume that cost a year's wages and dumped it on Jesus. He, she gave this extravagant gift of worship. And what it's saying is, these are people that Jesus loved. It says, the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. The Greek work for love there is phileo. That's friendship love. Most of the time when we talk about love in the Bible, we talk about agape love or, or agapeo love. For God so loved the world, agapeo. That means, that means God loves everybody. God, 
God gave his life for the world. But this says this person was his friend. In other words, God loves everybody, but he liked these people. He liked them. They were close to him. But yet, this sickness happened to them. So, let's go to number two. Let's see God's purpose. Sickness and suffering in God's people happens for God's purpose. Verse four says, when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. <laughs> Jesus is saying, not today, death. This de- this, this de- I am gonna conquer this death. I'm gonna show them that I have power over death. So it, it's gonna end good. But right now, it's hurting this family. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. This is going to happen so God will be on display. Jesus Christ will be on display. People are going to see His glory, His power, who He is. Uh, Jesus said, when I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Men will come to me when I'm glorified. So that's why this is going to happen. This is going to bring people to Jesus. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. Agape love. That's agape. He was going to give his life for them. He loved them. He cared about them. He liked them. Verse 6. But when he, So when he heard that Lazarus was ill... He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. They sent word. They know that Jesus has been healing all kinds of people. They know their only hope is to get word to Jesus to come and save Lazarus' life. But Jesus stays there on purpose two more days. He doesn't lift a finger to go and help with the sickness. Wow. Why? Because he had a greater purpose. And sometimes in our trial, in our pain, in our prayers for our sick loved ones, and our blessed church members that we've prayed for, we pray, and it just seems like, where is Jesus? We've called on him. He loves us. But Jesus is doing something greater And we're going to have to trust him. They needed to see. They they all knew what Jesus could do before death. They were seeing it. So they were starting to believe it. You got to probably think they were kind of thinking, you know, hey, we're going to be okay. Because if. We get hungry and we're out in the middle of nowhere. Jesus will just feed us. He'll just turn, make food out of the air. Uh, If we get sick, hey, we're good. Jesus will just heal us. But what if we die? And Jesus is going to show them, even after you die, I'm there. And he has power over death. He's going to go on to say, whoever believes in me will never die. Meaning, yeah, you die physically, but you don't die spiritually. You just relocate and you're with God forever. And Jesus wants them to know that. He wants us to know that. He wants us to believe that. So he lets him die on purpose. Number three, this is important. Let's talk about God's providence. We see God's providence here in this sickness and this death. Now, if you remember in the book of Romans, not long ago, we talked about God's providence. God's providence is that God is in control of everything. Sure, people have free will. You're not a robot. You make good choices. You make bad choices. But the sovereign God is over that. 
and his providence, his purpose will always prevail. And that's good to know that he is in absolute control. So even when the world looks like it's in utter chaos right now, our Lord and Savior is in absolute control. And he is controlling this entire event. Verse 7. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. So the two days were gone. He lets Lazarus die. So it's now it's time to go and do another miracle, another sign. We're going to go. We're going to go to Judea. Verse 8. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? They want to stone him. For some of you who are new at church, that's not getting high, okay? <laughs> that is stone you to death. That was the death penalty. We've already seen this in John's gospel. They have picked up stones to stone him a few times already. They want Jesus dead. What stands out to me there is, in, in all the things Jesus has done before these disciples, all the miracles he's already performed, all the great statements he's already made, they are still telling Almighty God what to do. It just amazes me. But don't we do it too? When we pray, don't we sometimes tell God what to do? Instead of just fully surrendering and say, God, I trust you. But God, if you're going to do it this way, if this is your will, God, I'm going to need your strength. I'm going to need help. I'm going to need extra power, God, to get through this. And this is what God wants to do. And he wants to take us to another level of faith and trust. Verse 9. Jesus answered. Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day. He does not stumble. Because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night. He stumbles. Because the light is not in him. What is that all about all of a sudden? I'm glad you asked. Let me explain that to you, all right? He gives a little parable here. He's answering their fears about going to Jerusalem. He's answering their fears about going there. And he says, if the Jews broke down a day, 12 hours in the day, 12 hours at night. And Jesus is saying here, if you're walking in the, if when you walk in the day, you don't stumble. You're able to see. You're not afraid of people, bandits coming to get you. The day is a lot safer. But if you walk at night, they had no street lights. You might stumble over something. something. Something could happen. But the parable is when you're walking in the light of God. When you're walking in the will of God, you don't have to be afraid of anything. Jesus is basically saying here, guys, I'm invincible. No one's going to take my life until I lay it down. We are getting closer in John's gospel toward Christ's death. But what Jesus is saying is nothing's going to happen to me and nothing's going to happen to you guys unless it's God's will. And I believe we can live this way today. I believe if we love God and we walk according to God's will, we don't have to be afraid. I'm not saying that doesn't mean we're clearly seeing that we could get sick. We could die. Who knows what could happen? But, but it's not going to happen unless God sovereignly allows it to happen. So we can, we can rest in that. And he was trying to get the disciples to see. But I will say to you, if you walk according to the darkness, you don't do the will of God. You want to do your own thing? You are going to stumble. And you, you might need to be afraid. 
But if you're God's sheep, as we talked about in chapter 10, no one can snatch you out of his hand. He's holding your life together. And so you can face this life trusting God that he's going to get you through no matter what. And that's what he was trying to tell them there. Verse 11. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Here come our buddies, the disciples. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Hey, let him sleep, Lord. Give him some NyQuil. He'll be all right. We don't need to go to Jerusalem. Just say the word like you did to that other guy and heal him. Verse 13. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Watch this. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. (laughs) Jesus makes some very radical statements at times. That's pretty radical. Lazarus is dead and I'm glad. Imagine that. And it doesn't say here, but I can see the disciples whispering like they always do. He, he's glad? Lazarus is dead and he's glad? This guy who's one of his best friends, this guy who supported his ministry, and he's glad? Because they're blind to what Jesus is going to do, and they, they're not yet fully trusting him. And when it says Jesus is glad, Is he ha-ha happy about it? No. Listen, he was under a great deal of pressure. So much to the point, we're going to see, it's the famous, this is the famous chapter where Jesus cries. He cries. He weeps. Because he, this is, it's burdened him so much that he's had to allow these best friends that he loves to go through this and they're distraught. And when he gets there and sees how distraught they are, he cries. So don't think that God doesn't care when you're going through your sickness, your pain, your trial, whatever it is. He sees it and he cares deeply for you. And he hurts with you, clearly. Scripture says. So don't ever ever let the devil whisper in your ear and say God doesn't care because he cares so much for us so let's go to the final point I call this God's preparation God's preparation of course this miracle that he's going to do raising Lazarus from the dead the most important thing is to show that Jesus has power over death He is the Messiah. He is the only Savior of the world. He is the only way that your sins can be forgiven. He's the only way you can live forever. No one else can do that. Only Him. But in this too, with the disciples, He's preparing them. I believe God is always preparing us. We sometimes think, you know, we just believe in Jesus and then that's it. No, no, it's, a, it's an everyday thing. We constantly walk in it. We constantly grow in it. God is always preparing us somehow to go through something else, to have faith through something else. This is what he does with his people. And... The Holy Spirit, of course, puts this in there. Verse 16. So Thomas called the twin. We don't know who Thomas' twin was. He obviously had a twin. But Thomas, the disciple, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. (laughs) Love that. Guys, 
You're right, Jesus is going to die, we're going to die. Let's go die with him. <laughs> this, this is, Thomas displays incredible courage and commitment here in this statement. Jesus is preparing Thomas. You know, Thomas, all you Bible students, Thomas gets a bad rap, doesn't he? Because most of you know him as who? Doubting Thomas. The guy who said after the resurrection, I will not believe unless I touch the nail prints in his hand, touch the wound in his side when they plunge the spear through Jesus to prove he was dead. I won't believe until I touch him. And you got to understand, Thomas displays courage here. But of course, when Jesus is arrested, Thomas as well as the others, they all take off running. Peter denies him. They're not ready. They're not quite ready yet. They're not going to be ready till after the resurrection. Because even though they see, they're going to see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, they thought when Jesus was dead, that's it, because he couldn't raise himself. But they were going to be in for the shock of their life. And that's what eventually made them invincible. That's, way, that's what made Thomas and all these disciples go right into the city and preach the gospel. And they all went to their death except for the gospel of John. Jesus finally prepared them to be the men after he went. The men that would be used to start the church, to write the New Testament. And so, you know, I want to say to you, if, if you have doubt, have you ever doubted? My middle name is Thomas, so I've had a lot of doubts, especially when I was young. Sometimes when you go through something or you see something happen, it makes you doubt. Sometimes when you're distraught about something in your life, it'll make you doubt. And of course, the enemy wants to put doubts in our mind. But remember this, John the Baptist, who Jesus said, was the greatest man born of woman after introducing Jesus and all the great things John did and said, when they threw him in a dungeon, John doubted. He doubted. But John loved Jesus. John loved God. There was no one like him. He, his job was to introduce Jesus. And so because Jesus knew John's heart, he sent word to him and encouraged him to overcome his doubts. When you doubt, God's not mad at you. God's just gonna, God's just gonna prove himself to you if you love him. See, Thomas, Thomas loved Jesus. He was distraught when Jesus died. But of course, they told him Jesus is alive. He wanted Jesus to be alive in his heart. He was just so distraught. But because Jesus knew his heart, Jesus showed up and helped him overcome his doubts. Jesus will do that for you. So I don't know what you're going through. I don't know if you're distraught, if you're doubting, if you're discouraged. Trust Jesus. He wants to show himself to you. He understands we're going to doubt as human beings. But he is going to help us. He is going to prepare us. And he is going to help us overcome our doubts. So Thomas displays incredible loyalty here. And of course, we know Thomas will, will eventually go to his death for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in closing... Um, 57 verses in this chapter. I'm just introducing it, but we got to look at the good part, right? We got to look at the good part. Let, let's, let's just look. I can't look at all of it, but I just want to read the part where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead because it is just powerful. And we live in a world today of fantasy. We've got technology and special effects we got all these superheroes and Harry Potter and Star Trek and vampires. We've got all this fantasy going on. And I think sometimes it clouds our minds. 
And when we see a simple story about someone being raised from the dead, we're like, man, I already saw that on Netflix, you know? And that's sad because that is all fantasy. It's not real. In this day, in this moment, this was an absolute powerful miracle. It blew them away. It blew them away. Let's read it. So this is now, he's already talked to the sisters. They're distraught. They're complaining. If you would have been here, our brother would not have died. Jesus says some things to them to console them, to point them to trusting in him. He comes to the tomb. We know he cries before this. He sees the hurt and pain. And he begins to weep. We come to verse 38. It says, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. In the Greek, deeply moved. The Greek word, he snorted like a horse. Meaning he burst out. He, he, was, now, he was crying and now he burst out. You ever burst out and cry over a loved one? This is what Jesus did here. He's deeply moved. He, come, he burst out in tears. And it was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. For he has been dead four days. <laughs> it's common sense. Martha's, she's still doubting. But she's just stating the ob obvious. Lazarus has decayed. There is no hope for him. And what's Jesus? Verse 40, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Underline that in your Bible. Jesus is saying, if you believe, you trust him, you will see the glory of God. You might go through sickness. You might go through pain. You might go through stuff you can't understand. But if you believe, the day will come you will see the glory of God. And God wants us to know that. Something greater we're going to see. I, I think we see it sometimes in life. I see God working on people in the midst of sickness and death in an amazing way. But, but when we get to the other side, oh, we're going to know why. And we're going to be thankful. And we're going to be thankful for, for what God did in our life, even when we doubted, even when we failed to have faith. Verse 41, so they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe you sent me. Jesus saying, Father, I'm saying this prayer so they will see this, this power is coming from you and from me together. Verse 43, when he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen stri strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. I love what Pastor John MacArthur says. He says, it's a good thing Jesus said Lazarus or every dead person in there would have came out when he gave that loud command. So true. And read John 5. Because Jesus said the day is coming when every dead person will hear the voice of who? The Son of God. And they will be raised. And some will be raised to go to the great white throne judgment and be condemned because they refuse to believe. And others will be raised for eternal life to live on a new heaven and a new earth where there'll be no more crying, no more pain, and no more death. I can't wait. Can't wait. And that's our Jesus. But until then, we got to trust him. Let's trust him together. We got hard times ahead. Who knows? I hope the, the, Lord, the Lord could come back at any moment. And I, I say, amen, come Lord Jesus, I'm ready. But no matter what, I'm telling you today, if you love and believe in Jesus, you can trust him. You will see 
The glory of God. Here's Lazarus, you know, he, Jesus has to tell him to take off the clothes. Why? Because they mummified people. So he came out like a mummy. They had to help him get out of the clothes, poor guy. But think about it. Jesus had to give him new organs, new skin. This was a powerful miracle. I don't know if I was there in the crowd. I'd be like, you going to go shake his hand? I'm not going to go shake his hand. You shake that mummy's hand, you know? <laughs> but you know Mary and Martha embraced Lazarus. <laughs> Lazarus probably said, will you get these clothes off me like Jesus said? You know, they're, they're hugging him. They loved him. And this is a preview. Listen, let me say this. This is important. Lazarus got sick and died again. But I have a feeling when Lazarus died, he went to paradise. And, and I, think, I think, you know, the religious leaders, you think they believe in Jesus now that he raised him from dead? No. They still want to kill Jesus, and now they want to kill Lazarus. I think Lazarus is like, make my day, man. I've already been there. I'm not afraid. It's a preview of coming attractions, okay? In this life, there is sickness, there is death. But when we die as believers, we live on with Christ. But there's coming a day when he is going to raise us. We're going to see the glory of God. And we're going to live with him forever. Do you believe this? Believe, my friends. Trust him. It's true. Pray with me this morning. Pray with me. Pray with me today as we close this out. We had a couple baptisms in the first service. So you got to start coming to that first service. There's a lot of room in there. But it was a beautiful, beautiful, couple beautiful baptisms of people who have given their life to Christ and wanted to be obedient to God in baptism. Thank God for that. That's what it's all about. That's what our church is all about. Reaching people with the good news of the gospel. If you've come in here today, you stumbled in here today, and I don't know, you kind of know about God. You, you think you believe in him. You're not sure if you believe in him. Listen, Jesus Christ wants to do a work on your heart. He wants, he wants you to have faith in him. He wants you to know him personally. Not that you just know about him. Not that you, oh yeah, I've always heard these stories. No, he wants you to know him personally. And he wants to prepare you and grow you and use you. And continue to build your faith so you can trust him. And you can help others trust him. And it's not that hard. It's just simply you saying to God, 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 I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. God, I know when I die, I have no power to get to you. Jesus you died for my sins. That's my only hope. You died to give me forgiveness and then you rose from the grave to show that you're the way, the truth, and the life. Just say, Lord, I surrender my life to you. Help me to follow you. And if you need help, our church will help you grow. We'll answer your questions. We'll help you overcome your doubts. Father, thank you today uh, for church. God, we love church around here. We love coming here and singing praises. God, we love opening up the word and letting the word speak to us. Father, God, we're sorry that we doubt you at times. We're sorry that we get caught up in the world and all the world and their questions. But thank you that when we come to church and hear your word, God, you, you build our faith. And God, you make yourself so real to us. And Lord, we want to trust you. God, we're weak. We're weak. So we need your strength. We need your spirit to help us. As the man asked you, Jesus, 
He said, help my unbelief. We ask you today, God, to help our unbelief. Help us to trust you. Help us to love you. Help us to be like Thomas. Help us to have courage and commitment to follow you. Lord, thank you for all these things. Thank you for being a great Savior. We pray always in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand. We're going to sing a really good song. We'll close out the service.